Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So, the case that I have for you all today is one that recently went to trial and thankfully there has been a conclusion. But even so, while I do think there was enough information to convict the person responsible, there are still questions as to the motive because honestly, there could have been two different reasons for the murder and I really want to hear what you all think the motive was after hearing the information. With that being said, let's get right into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Shanti Cooper Trones. Shanti Cooper was described as being hardworking, intelligent, and talented. She worked as a financial accounting consultant, earning over six figures per year. She had previously been married to a man named Jim Cooper, and together, the two had a son named Jackson, who was eight years old at the time of her death. By 2013, Shanti and Jim did get a divorce, but they both worked hard to take care of their little boy. Shanti was described as a dedicated mother who cared so deeply about her son, and she would do anything to take care of him. Her son was her entire world. At some time after the divorce, Shanti launched a financial software business, which allowed her to work from home in her home office. She was described as being a type A personality who was very intentional about everything she did. She was a very open person with a dominant personality, and she did her best to earn a good living for herself and her son. By March of 2013, Shanti was online using Match.com when she met a man named David Trones, whose last name I have seen pronounced differently, literally within the same courtroom. Some people would say Trones, some people would say Trones. I'm not exactly sure, but I'm just going to say Trones because that's what I heard more commonly. But either way, David was 10 years older than Shanti, but he definitely didn't look that much older. He just had a young look to him that made him look a lot younger than he really was. Dave was also just recently divorced and was looking for love, just like Shanti. He was based out of Minnesota, while Shanti was living in Orlando, Florida. So the two started their relationship by exchanging messages on their profile, and they quickly grew a connection. After that, they started exchanging emails, which seemed to be very exciting for Shanti as their relationship grew. In one undated email, she wrote to Dave, quote, Dave, I will have to say, I think this will be a delicious detour. Amazing, magnificent, life-changing detour. I have had a pep in my step since we started this little email affair. After spending some time emailing back and forth, the two started flying between Minnesota and Florida to see each other in person. Then, after a few months of this long-distance whirlwind of a relationship, David moved all the way to Florida to be with Shanti. Now, Dave's financial situation is a bit confusing. It was said that Dave had a very successful career back in Minnesota, which he obviously had to quit to come move to Florida. A lot of people said that he was a fake millionaire and sort of exaggerated the amount of money he had, but it did seem like he had some money. He was overall described as intelligent and likable, and he made it clear to Shanti that he did have a lot of money. So we don't know if Dave was just able to accumulate a large amount of money from his job by maybe saving it up over the years and just lived very cheaply, or if he just made a shit ton of money and just had all of this money from his previous job, or if he got it another way. Some sources report that he inherited a large amount of money at one point, but either way, he did portray himself as a millionaire. Now, after moving to Orlando, Dave and Shanti decided that they kind of wanted to start a new chapter in their lives together. So, they moved to a nice, well-established neighborhood just outside of Orlando called Delaney Park. Dave fell in love with Delaney Park, and while there, they found the perfect home. The couple purchased an older Victorian-style home for $607,500, which Dave bought in cash. Apparently, the home was purchased using a trust that Dave had set up for himself and his mother, so the home was listed under his name. Shanti's name was not a part of that home, but of course, he purchased the home for the both of them. With his home, the idea was that Dave, Shanti, and Jackson would live in that house while doing some renovations to the inside, which Shanti would be paying for. 
It seemed like an ideal situation that worked out. Dave paid for the entire house in cash, while Shanti paid for the renovations. It seemed very fair, and it worked out well. Now, after moving to Orlando from Minnesota, Dave did not work. Like I said, Shanti was an entrepreneur. She was a type A personality who was very structured and organized. She worked pretty much constantly to keep a steady flow of income for the family. Meanwhile, Dave didn't work the entire time he lived in Florida. Instead, he took care of the home, the dog, the yard, and the pool, and he oversaw the home renovations. By early 2017, the couple became married and renovations to the home were well underway. However, these renovations were significantly more intense than they ever imagined. It turned into a giant money pit and it seemed like no matter what renovations were taking place, Dave was never happy, so he wanted more and more and more done. By early to mid-2017, the living room, kitchen, and the dining area were totally gutted. Over the course of the months that followed, the structural integrity of the home became questionable. Dave ended up telling Shanti that the contractors kept quitting or leaving and not returning, so they kept having to hire new ones, and that is why it was taking so damn long. The only livable spaces were the upstairs bedroom where Shanti and Jackson stayed together. They basically treated that bedroom as a little apartment that had its own bathroom, it was where Shanti worked, and then Shanti and Jackson would sleep in the room as well. I believe Shanti had a bigger bed and Jackson slept in a bunk bed, and that is also where they spent their free time because they pretty much couldn't leave. Meanwhile, there was a bit of space in the garage that acted as a room where David slept with the dog and spent his time. They also made a little makeshift kitchen in the garage as well. Now, it was stated by some sources that Dave pretty much just kept to himself in that little kitchen area, while other sources stated that he slept in the bed with Shanti most of the time, but she snored really loud. So anytime he needed some time to himself, that is when he would sleep in the garage area. That's a fact that was argued at trial, whether or not he spent time ever sleeping with Shanti or if he spent all of his time alone. So we don't know for 100% certainty what the entire situation was, but it kind of seemed like Dave would sometimes sleep with Shanti in their upstairs apartment bedroom situation. And then sometimes he needed time to himself to sleep in the garage to get away from the snoring. Over the course of these renovations and the fact that the couple weren't staying in the same room all of the time, they weren't spending too much time together and they were spending a shit ton of money all coming from Shanti while Dave didn't even work that put a ton of pressure on the relationship. The house basically became a two-story empty shell that was barely being held up because they took out so many of the structural walls. There was debris everywhere. There were exposed water pipes sticking out, electrical wires hanging from the walls and ceilings, and there was no flooring. There was just wood panels scattered around on top of dirt. It pretty much sat there for a year at that point, with Shanti being $250,000 in the hole for a project that was going nowhere. But soon after, Dave had spoken to a local man named Keith Ori, who was a home renovator in the area who had previously appeared on the reality show called Zombie House Flipping. This is basically a reality show where they feature the worst of the worst homes, they renovate the homes, and bring them back to life. Now, while the couple weren't going to be receiving any payment for being on the show, they were given some benefits including upgraded contractors and some free labor that would save them upwards of $25,000 to $30,000. They looked at this as a lifeline to finally get the house under control. According to Keith Ori, when he looked at the home, he was astonished in his own words. He said that they took out the interior dividing walls and there was basically nothing in the home. He said that this was one of the worst cases of OCD he has ever seen. Basically, the contractors would do their work and then Dave was never happy and he just kept wanting more and more and more done until there was nothing left so that everything in the house could be brand new. Keith said that he knew that this was going to be quite the task, but it was a bold challenge that he was ready to take on. 
So the decision for Dave and Shanti was either to pause construction and just leave the home a disaster for a few months until the show could start renovations or continue renovations as scheduled and not appear on the show and not get any sort of monetary benefit. But they did ultimately decide that being featured on the show was their best option. So by mid-April of 2018, Keith got the go-ahead to feature their home on the following season of Zombie House Flipping. Now, that same year, around the same time in early 2018, the stress that Shanti was facing increased even further. She had been diagnosed with appendicitis. There were months where she was struggling with her health issues, feeling sick all of the time, having to go to doctor's appointments and being in and out of the hospital while still being the sole breadwinner of the relationship. Thankfully, after a few months, she did get her appendix removed and she felt a lot better, but the stress remained. During this time, to help lessen the load that Shanti had to deal with, she hired a nanny to help out with caring for Jackson. Now, of course, in order for the show to go on as scheduled, Keith needed to make sure that both Shanti and Dave were on the same page. It was April at that point, and they were set to start filming in May. So, he needed to meet with the both of them in person to speak with both of them together to go over everything from the production of the show, how it would work, to the renovations that they would be making to the home. This, however, seemed like an impossible task at the time because Keith was struggling to get any time with them together at the same time. So, Keith let the couple know that in order for this to work, they needed to sit down all together to discuss things. Otherwise, this was not going to happen. So finally, Keith was able to find time to sit down with the both of them at their home. Now, Dave initially tried meeting with Keith by himself at the home. Shanti was there, but she was upstairs and refused to come down at first until Keith was able to convince her to partake in the meeting. Once she joined them, it was clear that Shanti was pissed. She didn't seem interested in being on the show whatsoever. She sat down for a few minutes and listened to what Keith had to say, and she did agree to be on the show. But immediately after, she got up and left, clearly looking pissed off at Dave. Now, by the night of Monday, April 23rd, 2018, Shanti and Dave had the house to themselves, with Jackson staying with his father, Jim, that night. All throughout the day on April 23rd, Shanti was active on her phone, calling and texting people as normal, up until the evening. That evening, Shanti spoke with Jackson on the phone as she did any time he was at his father's house. According to a steps tracker on Shanti's phone, she was up and active all day until she stopped moving around that evening. Now, according to Dave, that night of the 23rd, going into the early morning hours of April 24th, him and Shanti had been in the upstairs apartment bedroom together before Dave retreated back downstairs to his space in the garage room with the dog, and the two went to bed separately. According to Dave, by around 9.15 a.m. that next morning on April 24th, Shanti came down the stairs, went outside, and smoked a cigarette by the pool. Apparently, she was an occasional smoker, so that is how she started her morning that day. As Shanti smoked her cigarette, her and Dave spoke briefly before Shanti returned back upstairs to start her workday from home. Dave then says that by 9.25-ish, he went out to walk the dog for about 10 or 15 minutes. He then came back to the home, cleaned up the yard a bit, and took care of the pool. An hour later, after doing that yard work, by 11.45, Dave took the dog to the dog park, arriving at noon where they stayed for about an hour and 45 minutes. During that time, Dave did not look at his phone at all. Not once, he had absolutely zero activity on his phone. After being at the dog park, he got back home at around 2 p.m. He then did some more yard work and apparently cleaned the pool again. That entire day up to that point, he and Shanti had not spoken to one another. They didn't call or text each other, and even when he was at the home, he didn't go to her room to check in on her or speak with her. But by that evening, he started to wonder who was going to pick Jackson up from his father's house to come to their house. So, that is when he finally went upstairs to talk to Shanti. 
As he walked upstairs, he heard the sound of water trickling from the bathtub. He said this was a pretty loud sound, so if she was making noises up there, it might have covered that sound. So he called out for Shanti, but he got no answer. So he entered the bathroom to see if Shanti was in there, and immediately upon entering, he found Shanti lying face down, partially submerged in a half-filled bathtub. Her face and arm were both in the water, with her legs sticking out of the tub, and she was not moving. Immediately, Dave was extremely worried that Shanti had possibly fallen in the water and hurt herself. So, he tried picking her up, but he wasn't able to move her because she was really stiff and difficult to move. So, instead, he opted to grab her and drag her across the bathroom, across the floor, and into the bedroom apartment. Before putting her on the bed, he cleared the bed of the shoes that were lying on the bed and then placed her there. After that, he called 911 to report that he had just found his wife unconscious, not moving, and not breathing. He said that he tried CPR, but he couldn't get her to breathe. He said on the call that he thinks something is wrong, that he thinks she slipped or fell, or maybe she blacked out. He seemed hysterical on the call, and he was very, very upset with what he just saw. <laughs> Okay, I want you to take a 
want you to play. I want you to put your mouth down by her. I want you to put your ear down by her mouth and tell me if you feel or hear any breathing, okay? <laughs> Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. I have help responding to you emergency, okay? She is not breathing. Okay. Okay. I want you to put the heel of your hand on the center of the chest. Um, okay. 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 Right between the nipples, okay? Put your other hand on top for that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I want you to pump her chest hard and fast at least yeah. twice per second. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> okay. I want you to just let the chest come up all the way between pumps, and we're going to do this until half can take over. Okay. I want you to count out loud. They're almost there, too. They're responding emergency to you. There's a flu, there's a flu, flu, I'm sure they have to come back. Oh, God. Oh, God. What is blue? The blue dumpster, big blue dumpster in the driveway. They have to turn in. And they, if they can get past it, they have to drive past it. If they can't get past it, they'll park they out they in the street. Put, they'll just park out in the street. They come up. Yeah, 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 but we're in the back, we're in the far back. They have to get back to the game and go up the stairs. Oh, God! <laughs> oh, There's water. There's water. There's water. Are there any animals or anything in the house? They're downstairs, they're downstairs, they're in their kennel, they're, 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 they need to come up the stairs. I did tell them they need to come up the stairs, okay? I want you, all when you hear them coming in, when you hear them come in, I want you to call them, okay? Has she been sick or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the time first responders got to the scene, unfortunately, 38-year-old Shanti Cooper Drones had already been deceased. There was nothing that they could do to save her. However, investigators on the scene noticed that what they were being told by the dispatcher did not really match up with what they were seeing. Now, the original detective noticed right away that the inside of the bathtub was completely dry and the bathroom floor was dry and Shanti's skin was dry and her clothes were only slightly damp. That didn't make sense because Dave said that he called 911 as soon as he found Shanti in that bathtub. So, if she was pulled out of the tub and the tub was drained right after being filled with water, then she would still be soaking wet and the bathtub would still be damp by the time investigators arrived. They found that her body was already in a state of rigor mortis, meaning that she had already been dead for quite some time before she was found. There were also no signs that Dave had attempted CPR either. Then, when examining her body, police noted right away that her injuries were not consistent with a slip and fall in the bathtub. They found that Shanti had bruising around her eye as well as blood all over her face coming from a laceration on her cheek. There was bruising all over her neck, scrapes all over her legs from being dragged, and multiple other injuries all over her body. There was petechiae in her eyes, which was consistent with strangulation. 
They also found that there was blood spatter on the bed that looked very out of place, and they thought that this could have been where she was originally injured. When detectives asked about that spot of blood, Dave said that it must have been a spot from where Shanti had her period, but detectives knew that this blood did not look like menstrual blood. Dave continued to say that he didn't know what happened, saying that she must have slipped and fell into the bathtub. But once he started realizing that his story did not make much sense, he gave another possible explanation. Maybe when he was gone, someone broke into the home to rob them and ended up beating and killing Shanti. Dave told police that $5,000 was missing from the home. Not only that, but Shanti's $15,000 diamond engagement ring was also missing. That was very concerning to police because everyone who knew Shanti knew that she never took off her engagement ring. She wore that thing every day no matter what. She was very proud of it. She loved it. So there was no reason for it to be missing. However, police did note that they had many other expensive electronics around the home. Shanti's diamond earrings were on her nightstand. Actually, one diamond earring was on the nightstand and one was still in her ear, and there were no signs to the doors or windows or anything else to show that somebody had broken into the home. So, it didn't really make sense that someone could have broken in, but the missing money and the missing engagement ring were of interest to the police, so they still wanted to get to the bottom of that. Now, after finding Shanti's body, of course, she was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner found that Shanti had suffered from blunt force trauma that could be consistent with a number of causes, such as being hit or from falling. The injury to her cheek could have been from a ring or something else like that, cutting her cheek while being hit. So if you're being punched in the face and someone has a ring on, that could have caused the abrasion that she had. She also had abrasions on her knees, which the medical examiner believed was consistent with Shanti being dragged while she was still alive. They found that the cause of death was actually the result of strangulation due to those bruises all around her neck, and her manner of death was determined to be homicide. After examining the home and Shanti's body, police took Dave into the police station for an interview. In the interview, Dave told much of the same story. He said that things were just fine between the couple at that time. He adamantly denied that they had fought or had any issues with one another the night before or the day of the 24th. He said that on the morning of April 24th, Shanti had been working all morning while David was up and doing errands, taking care of the dog and doing the yard work and the pool work, like I said. Then that afternoon, he went upstairs to check on Shanti, but he heard the running water. Once again, he described how he found her body. He said that he tried doing CPR, but when he lifted her head, she started bleeding all over from the cuts on her cheek. The first detective in the room was just listening to what he was saying. He was acting very upset, sounding like he was on the brink of crying, but he never actually got to the point of crying or being all that upset. Then another detective came in, and that is when she started hitting him with the harder and harder questions. She pointed out that if she slipped and fell in the bathtub from stepping in and falling, that she would have fallen backwards, not forwards, and folded herself to be in the bathtub when she fell. She pointed out how if he pulled Shanti out of the bathtub and immediately called 911, by the time police arrived three minutes later, the room and Shanti would still be soaking wet. It made no sense that everything was dry by the time they got there. The detectives were confrontational and they said that he knew exactly what happened and he was not giving them the full story. He knew what happened. Nobody else did. She said that he better figure his story out because nobody is going to believe what he was saying. They pointed out how he had been fake crying for hours and not one tear has come out of his eyes. They said that they wrote down every time he fake cried and they were not going to just sit there and listen to it anymore. They talked about how he showed no remorse, no empathy, no nothing. He doesn't care about Shanti. He only cares about protecting himself not about finding justice for whatever happened to Shanti. Because you heard the water and didn't hear her, you felt something was wrong? One room, I, I went upstairs. I don't hear her talking on the phone, so I say hello. I don't hear anything back. 
I can hear water running. Um, she's not saying anything. It doesn't seem right. Sometimes it is hard if you have the water running to hear somebody out there, so that, that was my assumption. Okay, so you, it's one room. You don't see her? Until is I get to the bathroom. Okay. Is the bathroom door open or closed? Open. Open? Okay, and so you walk toward the water that you're hearing? Yeah, I walk into the bathroom. Okay, and the door is open, and what happens? What do you see? I see her laying with her head in the right hand corner. Um, the water is running, but I don't think I don't think the drain is closed because it, if it was, it would be it would be going over, right? So the water's like half full. She's submerged partially. But she's also partially not submerged, and one of her legs is kind of sticking up and out a little bit. And it's just extremely awful, and it doesn't look natural. Obviously, she fell, or something happened. And I, um, I tried to pick her up. I turned the water off. I tried to pick her up. She's, she's stiff. Um, it's hard. She's stiff. It's, it's hard to pick her up. She's not. It's like a sack of potatoes. You know, it's not easy. Um, she's not moving with me. I grabbed her arms and kind of pulled her this way. Um, and over. I think partially over, and that's when I realized that. Um, I wasn't going to be able to carry her. I tried to pull her. I, I, I was being as careful as I could, and at the same time, I wanted to get her out of the water. I was screaming, "What's wrong? What's wrong?" And um, I pulled her out into the other room, and I couldn't. I didn't know what to do. Um, I, she, it was hard to move her that way, so I, I turned her, and I held on to her, her wrist. I thought that I was still thinking that there's something I can do to help, and I'm trying to get, I'm kind of moving her, trying to get her to shake her a little bit, and trying to get the water out of her lungs. I got her in front of the couch. And I had to, I had to stop. I put her down, and I tried to to lift her head up to kind of clear. Like you, I guess it's a thing you do if you're going to do CPR or something. And she's not responding. She has blood coming down her face and on the side of the body. And um, I'm still thinking she's uh, somehow I'm still thinking that she's going to be okay. I got the um, um, we had taken the mattress pad off the bed. I set the mattress pad um, down underneath her and I set her on it and I tried to lift her and I wiped. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what had happened. I tried. I had a towel that I had used to pull her out of the shower or out of the tub with. I tried to wipe her off to see what was. Where was the blood coming from? Um. The left side of her face, here, on her cheekbone. Is that the right side? Um, I'm looking... Or is it both? Mm, I don't think so. Um, she, had, she had blood. She had blood on the side of her head. 
down her neck. And, um, and when I touched, when I wiped the part on her cheek, it's her left, it must have been her left. So it's my right as I'm looking at her. Right? I'm looking down. My right to her left. I wipe it. And I, more blood comes out. Didn't, she didn't stick her foot in the shower and slip. That didn't happen. If she did, she would have fell backwards. And you didn't find her at 3 o'clock. Didn't that didn't happen. I don't, I don't know that. You don't know that? Common sense would tell you if you pull a woman soaking wet out of a tub at 3 o'clock and call the police within 6 minutes, then everything will be soaking wet when the police arrive within three minutes of that. Yeah. That's common sense. So how did everything dry up? That's our question. Because she happened? wasn't pulled out at three o'clock. It didn't happen. Nope. There's a science behind evaporation, <coughs> and that science is not matching. It's not the magic. Three okay. o'clock. I can take a shower at 6.30 in the morning and at 10 o'clock at night my towel's still wet. The shower even stays wet. I mean, it's just, it's just common sense. The water was definitely filled up to where you said, but not at 3 o'clock. That's the sliver of truth. There's blood in the water. There's another sliver of truth. Mm -hmm. I know you think you thought of everything, but you didn't. I, I don't think I thought of everything. I've, just, I've told you over and over, I don't know. You do know. You have to stop saying you don't know, because you do know. You do, David. You do know. You know exactly what happened because it was only you and her there. There was nobody else there. Nobody. I don't know what happened when I wasn't there. No, I'm not there. I, there, I'm had, sure. there, had, there had to have been, there had to have been close to well over an hour in the morning that I wasn't there, and well over two hours in the afternoon that right, I wasn't there. Right, that's very possible that you left the residence. However, when you were there, whatever happened to her happened when you were there. It didn't happen when you were gone. It happened when you were there, and I wouldn't expect you to know what happened when you were gone. Nothing happened when you were gone. She was already deceased. Talk around in circles. Trust me. The evidence and her body speak for itself. And your story is BS. So you better figure it out before it goes too far. Because I'm telling you right now, nobody is going to believe that. Nobody. If you maintain that, you're going to look like a fool. Picture telling that story with your mother sitting there listening to that. And try it. Like, as it's picked apart by every, as it, as everything you told us is picked apart by everyone who testifies. And we haven't even hit on everything. We're waiting, we're holding some of it back, waiting to hear the truth. People can be sympathetic when they hear people be honest and remorseful. They can be empathetic to a situation that gets out of hand. But when people lie for hours on end, 
and say, I know nothing about nothing. I don't know how she got that way. I thought she tripped and fell. I wasn't home. I was here. I was there. Conveniently. Conveniently, you're not there. It's complete hogwash. And we haven't even got the medical examiner's findings from the strangulation and all the things that go along with that. It's science. It's not guessing. It's medical science. Plus everything we've done at your home tonight. We're still there. This BS about three o'clock in tubs and it's crap. It's crap. You know it's crap. It's a crappy story. Yeah, you don't know what happened when you were gone. I get it. But you know what happened when you were there. And that's what counts. You know, you fake cried for about seven or eight hours today. Not one tear came out of your eyes. Not one. Not one. Not on scene with the officers. Not in this room. You have fake cried over this woman's death since we made contact with you for hours. And every single time you fake cried, we wrote it down. Not one tear came out of your eyes. Not one. Nope. Okay? We've been extremely patient with you for a very long time. I am losing my patience at this point because there is not a lick of remorse for what you did to this woman. Not even a little bit. Okay? I'm really starting to believe you wanted her dead. And I'm really starting to believe you planned it. David, because not a lick of remorse. Not even a little. You sat there for the last two hours and stared at her picture and you haven't cried. Not one tear. You're staring at a woman you're telling us you're in love with and you've done nothing the whole time. But close your eyes, huddle up, and protect your own ass. And that's all you've done. You've not shed one tear on that picture. Not one. You claim to love that woman. I would be under the fucking table in a ball if I was in love with that woman and she was dead. I, I would be inconsolable. I wouldn't even be able to utter the words or talk to detectives for six or seven hours like you have. Okay? You've not shed one tear in that picture. And you've been staring at it since she presented it to you. Two hours ago. Over two hours ago. You are not remorseful for what happened to her. You could give two shits about what happened to Shanti tonight. Okay? I told you she was murdered. Murdered. Someone took her life from her. And there's nothing. You can't even fake it. That's how much you could give a shit. You can't even fake it. I know you think your theatrics and your maybe some drama that you've had in your past was good. It was terrible. The officers on scene didn't believe you, and neither do we. You fucked up. That's the end of it. You screwed up. You made a mistake, whatever it is. I'm starting to believe it wasn't a mistake. I'm starting to believe that David wanted this chick dead. For whatever you might gain, for control, creative control of the house, so you can direct the build. I don't know what your motivation would be. But I know you stand to benefit. I know that the show that's going to happen is now yours. That all the decisions that are made are now yours. The 250 grand you tend to inherit, you can build the house of your dreams. Maybe never work again. I know there's motivation. Is it the accurate motivation? Maybe not. Is it what I'm going to paint you as? Probably. So after this interview, police were at the point where they believed wholeheartedly that Dave murdered his wife. The evidence pointed towards that theory, and everything that Dave was telling detectives was not adding up. But at that time, they technically did not have enough to actually arrest David, so after the interview, they had to let him go. 
After that, David returned back to the home that he once shared with Shanti, then went to live at his mother's house for the months following. Once he was back home, Dave contacted multiple of Shanti's friends and co-workers and other people who knew her. He continued to tell people that she slipped and fell and that she died because of a horrible, horrible accident. And there were a lot of people who believed him even after they found out the other information. Now, when police examined her phone, they found that the last call Shanti made was at 10.22 p.m. on April 23rd, which was a call to Jim Cooper, Jackson's dad, and her ex-husband. According to movement data from her phone, she last moved and was last active from 11.19 p.m. until 11.25 p.m. on April 23rd. By 6.58 a.m. on the morning of the 24th, they found that a client of Shanti's had reached out to her via text message to inquire about something related to a financial thing that they had consulted on. This text was never read or responded to. By 10 a.m. that same day, there was another client who reached out to Shanti that also was never read or responded to. This was very, very unusual because Shanti was known as being very responsive and responsible when it came to her clients. That was something she prided herself on. She was responsive to a fault. She would respond right away to clients whether it was work hours or not. So the fact that she didn't even read these messages when she was supposedly in her home office and working per Dave's reporting, that was very concerning. Then police spoke with several witnesses who knew the couple. So many people who knew both Dave and Shanti said that they had never noticed anything off about them. Shanti never expressed any concerns about Dave. She never told anybody that he was mean or violent. In fact, the way she acted when she was with him showed everybody that she was very much in love with him and that they had a very solid relationship. No one who knew them thought that anything could have been wrong and no one thought that Dave would have ever done anything to hurt Shanti. The only person who saw some cracks in their relationship was Keith, who I mentioned earlier, was the man setting them up with the zombie flipping show. And when he saw that, she was a very stressed wife who was tired of living in a shell of a home. That didn't necessarily mean that they had a bad or violent relationship. Living in a shell of a home with constant renovations, that would be stressful for anybody no matter how happy your relationship is. Some of their friends were 100% convinced of Dave's burglary story that somebody must have broken in and hurt Shanti because there was no way that Dave would have been the one to hurt her. But as police continued their investigation, police found something that was very startling to them. There was one witness who came forward who was an employee at Club Orlando. Club Orlando was a same-sex bathhouse where some people would hook up and have sex. According to this employee, David had a membership there and renewed it every six months. So, police went to the club to investigate further, and they found another employee at the club who said that he saw David having sex at the club with another man on at least two occasions. Police did find receipts that confirmed that he visited the club at least 78 times since June of 2016, with the last time being 13 days before Shanti was killed. Now, I do want to note that him visiting a bathhouse alone is not enough to say that he definitely was involved in these relations. He could have just been going there for the relaxation and spa that they offer. There's a lot of reasons why people will go to bathhouses. Not all of them are going there to hook up. But again, that employee did say that he saw him hooking up. So take that with what you will. Of course, hearing this information was very shocking given that David was not only married, but he was married to a woman. There was no evidence of whether or not Shanti actually knew about it. But police did wonder if it was possible that Shanti found out about his extramarital activities and was upset. 
Maybe she threatened to divorce him and therefore would no longer be bankrolling these expensive renovations to the house. At the time, the house was literally the most important thing to David. So him losing Shanti meant losing the house and stopping his renovations. Police interviewed several friends and family members of Shanti's, and most people said that if Shanti had found out about what Dave was doing, that she would have been pissed as most wives would have been. She would have been heartbroken. However, some people claimed that she did know about it and she was okay with it. But police did not think that she would have just been chill with her husband going and having sex with other men while they are married. You have to have a very, very, very specific kind of relationship to be okay with that and it's definitely not common. So, it would be very shocking if she knew about it and was okay with it. Now, about four months after Shanti's death, by August 29th, 2018, police finally felt that they had enough to arrest David. So, he was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, which he pleaded not guilty to. At that time, he was denied bail and had to await his trial in jail. When they arrested David, police were able to obtain a search warrant to search through David's mother's home where he was staying after being released from the police station that first time. Well, while they were searching through David's room, they found a bag and inside that bag, they actually found Shanti's $15,000 engagement ring. So it was not stolen by a burglar. Dave had taken the ring off of his wife's lifeless body and hid it before telling police that he had no idea where that engagement ring was. He originally said that Shanti loved that ring, but she would never take it off. Obviously, someone had taken it, but he was the one who had it all along. So obviously for those months while investigating, police had to consider the burglar story. They didn't know where the ring went. But after finding the ring that clearly had been taken by Dave because a burglar is not going to steal the ring and then break in to his mother's house and then put it in a bag that Dave owns, that's ridiculous. They knew with absolute certainty that Dave was responsible for his wife's murder. After police had arrested Dave and continued with their investigation while he waited in jail, police got a tip that led them back to Minnesota where David lived before meeting Shanti. This witness told police that Dave had previously been married to a woman named Carol. But shortly after their marriage, Carol all of a sudden started becoming sick all of the time. Out of absolutely nowhere, she started having a trove of health issues that she had never experienced before. Carol did tell police that Dave cooked most of the food for the duration of their marriage. So police wondered if maybe he had been poisoning her and was trying to kill her that way. However, Carol said that her digestive issues continued to this day and she does not think that Dave had anything to do with them. However, police also found out that even after their divorce, Carol and Dave still had a shared bank account. That is not something that typically happens in a divorce. Couples that are splitting up typically do not continue to split their assets or manage each other's money. They found that even when Dave was in jail, Carol was continuing to help David with managing his bank accounts. So maybe Carol was getting some money out of Dave. And as you can probably guess, that is a reason why she could be lying. Yeah, maybe Dave was poisoning her, but now she's getting a lot of money out of it, so she's not gonna say anything about it. As we know, Shanti herself had a sudden bout of appendicitis and had to get her appendix removed. Even after that, Shanti continued to experience stomach issues that just did not seem to go away. She was eating all the right things, but things never quite felt better until the day she died. So maybe he was poisoning her. But the problem was that they didn't have any proof of it, so they couldn't really do much with this. It just sort of made them wonder if Dave had been planning Shanti's murder for a long time. But again, there was nothing they could really do with that information. Also, while Dave was in jail awaiting trial, one of his cellmates came forward to police to share information that Dave had allegedly shared with him. According to the inmate, Dave admitted that him and Shanti did have a fight on the night before her death. He said that there was an app on his phone that Shanti had found that had messages on it that indicated that Dave was having sex with other men. He said that Shanti threatened to show everybody these messages. 
He said that after Shanti said that, he snapped and freaked out. He said things that made this inmate believe that he did admit to killing his wife. However, when police looked into Dave's phone, they didn't find any apps like that. They didn't find any messages or anything else that indicated that the story was true. Plus, the man that was telling this story was in jail for sexual assault charges and was a registered sex offender, so police didn't really know what to make of this story. In the end, neither the defense or the prosecution felt that they could use this man as a witness because he just did not seem very credible. One more thing that I want to mention is that during the investigation, police had been surveilling Dave and the home that him and Shanti once shared via surveillance video. They found that one of Dave's prior defense attorneys entered the home and was looking around. It came out that while the defense attorney was in the home, he found a set of sheets balled up in the closet of their bedroom. Well, this defense attorney, I guess, took those sheets out of the home and did not inform the police or the prosecution of their existence until a few days before trial. There was no time for police to actually investigate these sheets. Like I mentioned earlier, police found spots of blood on the sheets that were on the bed in their bedroom. But this set of balled up sheets, this had a lot more blood on it. So it was clear that she was probably killed on these sheets, or at least the fight started there. And after Shanti's death, they were changed to the other sheets that were found. But obviously there was still a little bit of blood that got on them in the process. However, because of how those balled up bloody sheets were handled, they weren't able to use them in trial because of the issue of chain of custody. Who knows if they were tampered with or stored properly, that made them unusable in trial. So this witness saying that Carol and Shanti both may have been poisoned, the inmate saying that Dave said that he killed his wife because of his, you know, outside relations, as well as these bloody sheets, none of that was able to be used at trial. But police still had a ton of other evidence to go off of, so they felt confident going into the trial. The trial for these charges of first-degree murder started on October 12, 2023, over five years after the death of 38-year-old Shanti Cooper Trones. The prosecution argued that after Dave bought this home and started renovations, he just couldn't stop. This progressed until the home became a dangerous shell that even construction workers felt wasn't safe to live in. Certain construction workers didn't even feel safe being inside of the home because they felt that it was going to collapse on them. The renovations continued for over a year, and this put an immense amount of stress on the marriage between Shanti and Dave. She was bankrolling this entire thing, but from her perspective, nothing was being done. Progress was not being made, and her money was just going into a deepening money pit. They argued that tensions were building and building until the night of April 23rd, 2018. They believe that Shanti was getting ready for bed when a fight broke out, and this is proven by the fact that one of her earrings was placed on the nightstand and one was still in her ear. So they believe that she was taking her earrings out when a fight broke out. And then this fight turned into a physical altercation, which resulted in Dave killing Shanti. According to her phone, her last outgoing activity was at around 11 p.m., and her phone was moving around until it just stopped that night and no other activity was recorded. So, she was most likely not alive as of the morning of April 24th when Dave claimed that she was working from home. As we know, there could have been two reasons for this fight to have started. Either Shanti was simply tired of the renovations and didn't want to join that reality TV show and it made Dave upset and this entire thing just boiled over, or she found out that he was sleeping with other men and threatened to tell everybody. The prosecution, though, was focusing on the home renovation aspect of this since most of the other information came from witnesses that may not have been the most reliable. Either way, they argued that after murdering his wife, he went to bed and went about his day as normal on the morning and afternoon of the 24th. During that time, he was trying to figure out when he was going to call police, what he was going to tell them, and what he was going to do, 
until he finally called them that afternoon. After talking to the police, he didn't seem all that distraught. He acted upset, but police could tell that it was all an act how the story that Dave was telling everybody did not match what police found at all. The prosecution brought forward the evidence that we discussed all throughout the video, how stressed Shanti was. They brought the medical examiner to the stand who testified that she died as a result of blunt force trauma and strangulation, so clearly she was murdered. If this was an accident like Dave was claiming, her cause of death would have been drowning since she was found face down submerged in water. They argued that this was not an accident. They talked about how they found Shanti's blood on the bed as well as the bed frame and the carpet in Shanti's room. This is believed to be where she was attacked. The prosecution also brought up that David had a $350,000 life insurance policy on Shanti, so he did also benefit financially from her death. That could help pay for the home renovations. Then, of course, they said that there was no sign of a break-in, nothing missing from the home except Shanti's engagement ring before that, too, was found among Dave's belongings. This told them that Dave was trying to mislead police into believing that there was a burglar in the home. Why would he have done that unless he had a reason to want to steer police in a certain direction away from him? On the other hand, however, the defense argued that despite the prosecution saying that there was a ton of stress in the marriage and that the renovation caused so much tension that led to the murder, that this simply was not true. They had a happy marriage. They brought forward many witnesses who said that there were never any issues that they noticed in the marriage they always seemed like a very happy couple. The defense said that police had zeroed in on David from the very beginning. They never looked into any other suspect having tunnel vision and trying to prove that David was guilty. They said that instead of going where the evidence took them, they made the evidence fit Dave. The defense said that police had confirmation bias. They claimed that Shanti went to take a shower on the night of the 23rd when she blacked out and slipped and fell, and that is what really caused the injuries to her head. They argued that when Dave was being questioned, police manipulated Dave by holding him in that interview room for several hours, only allowing him to eat crackers that entire time to wear him down and make him more pliable. That is why he acted strange. He wasn't emotional and almost even fell asleep during the police interview. They said that there is no evidence that a violent attack took place in that room and that everything police said was based on their own biases. The trial lasted for a total of five days before both sides delivered their closing arguments. The jury then went into deliberations where they deliberated for over five hours before coming back with their verdict. They came back with the verdict of guilty for first degree murder and immediately David was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. State of Florida versus David Tronis, case number 2020 CF12472AL in the circuit court of the Ninth Judicial Circuit in and for Orange County, Florida. Verdict reads, we the jury find the defendant guilty of first degree murder as charged in the indictment. So it says we all dated at Orlando County, Orange County, Florida on the 18th day of October, 2023, signed by the four person. This has been a long, long, long time for us to see justice done. What this has done to me personally, this was more than my stepdaughter this was my daughter and what I go through every day. It's hard to put into words, but yet I need to express. I suffer so much with PTSD. This has affected me so much that it withdrew me from my grandson. Because every time I thought of Shanti or my grandson, the last time I saw my daughter, we work together. So every time that I think of Jackson, it brings to my mind my daughter and it upsets me. And all I can pray is that now that we can go forward from this day forward, and we can rebuild our relationship that we had. Your Honor, my mom was the best person I ever knew.
worked a lot, but she never put her family over work. <laughs> Early 2018, she was taken from me and my family. It's like a hole in my heart that I can't fill or fix. She didn't die peacefully. She did not deserve anything that happened to her that night. My family and I have been waiting for about five years for justice. I miss her so much. I would have never thought the day before was the last time I would see my mother alive. I miss the times where we would go to Universal or just the simple times like walking the dogs or going to the park. She was the best mom I could ever ask for. That's it. When Shanti and I were married, we tried for years to have a child with no success. It was an extremely difficult time for us and we were about to give up. When we got the wonderful news in early 2009, we did our best to raise him together. But as you know in life, it is not without its curveballs and heartaches. And when we di divorced, as difficult as it was, one thing we never fought or wavered on was raising Jackson the best we could. He's tall like his dad, but he got his brains, his compassion, and his outlook on life from his mother. And her and I moved forward and continued raising a wonderful son. When this parasite came into our lives, he took something from us, and most importantly from Jackson. And what he took is not replaceable. It is something that I struggle with every day. He lost a good parent. It is still unfathomable to me what he did to her and what he put Jackson through. He knew and he saw firsthand how special their bond was, and he still tortured him and brutally ripped her from this world, our lives, and Jackson's. Mr. Tronis, anything you wish to say prior to sentencing? I think you just said no, is that right? Okay. CF 18124.72, the court will adjudicate you guilty. We'll sentence you to life imprisonment. So at the end of this, obviously the whole situation is just heartbreaking and tragic. Shanti had a son who loved her and is absolutely devastated by the loss. I truly think that this situation happened as a result of so many different factors with the renovations just causing a lot of stress and tension that just continued building until something broke. I don't know if I think Shanti found out about his other affairs, alleged affairs outside of the marriage, because we truly don't know enough to say one way or the other whether this was really happening. But regardless, I obviously think that Dave killed Shanti and I think the stress of the home renovations definitely contributed to it, whether the fight broke out because of the home renovations or because of something else. I think they were just very stressed and things broke. But that is what I think and that is all of the information that I have on today's case. So now I want to hear what you all think about all of this. What do you think the motive here was? Do you think that Dave was involved in some secret affairs with other men? Do you think that Shanti found out about it? Or do you think they fought about the home renovations and that is what caused all of this? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All are going to be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.